on behalf of both the Professional Development Committee in Texas, as well as our Texas Board of Directors, thank you for, for attending. The, the purpose behind this meeting and the advocacy sushi part, if you will, is to make this an easy to understand, palatable, uh, easy, uh, you know, bite-sized morsels of just wonderful goodness. And we've got some some great speakers that are going to get into uh, really the, the, the meat behind, uh, or I guess the fish behind everything advocacy. So I'm excited for today. Uh, my role in this is simply to get out of the way. So I'm going to do that here in just a moment. Before I do, I want to introduce uh, our MC, Brandon Green, uh, who is not only a, a great friend but uh, of mine, but a great friend of, of NAFA as well. He's been in the business for over 20 years. Uh, lots of alphabet soup behind his name, including the CLU and the CHFC. He is a NAFA Houston Hall of Famer, a past Houston president, and uh, also a Lilly moderator. So the Leadership and Life Institute as well uh, as a, a number of things. I'm very active within our community here in Houston. <laughs> As Brandon gets ready to take the stage, I, I want to also inform everyone that questions or comments that you have, we do have the chat feature turned off, but please feel free to address any questions to uh, any of the hosts and the panelists, and, and I'll be in the background monitoring that activity as well. And after Brandon and the rest of the crew are done, I'll chime in uh, to, to take us out as well. So Brandon, floor is yours, sir. Good afternoon. Well, guys, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on this. I'm, I'm honored to uh, to MC this, and uh, the two panelists here, Doug Massey and Jason Talley, they're not just titans in our industry. I consider them both friends. Uh, Doug's got a, a full scope planning practice uh, focused mostly on uh, retirement and the 403B market, and Jason runs a full scope benefits practice uh, and is no slouch when it comes to, to life insurance and planning. So in addition to that, they both had deep, deep service for many, many years within NAFA. Uh, I think maybe they're so deep in they can't get out. So we're uh, regardless, we are delighted to have them here today. So topic is advocacy and what does that mean? I thought I'd start by <clears throat> maybe sharing my own journey and then uh, I'd like to flip over to, uh, to Doug and Jason. But when I first started with NAFA as a member, I, I was just interested in the sales ideas, right? I, I just wanted to find out how can I sell more, make more, and survive and thrive in this business. From there, it moved on to developing some what are now very deep friendships. Uh, and then I'm kind of embarrassed, but the last thing that happened is I really began to understand the advocacy, right? I, I got publicly embarrassed by my friend Danny O'Connell, I think, to make contributions to the pack. <laughs> Uh, and but I started to see what it really meant and, and going to visit with my state legislators in Austin and going to D.C. to sit down with our federal lawmakers. It really began to have an impact on me. And I began to really see how important NAFA and particularly this mission of advocacy is to our practice. So with that said, let me uh, let me get out of the way. Uh, Doug, I'll just uh, flip over to you. Okay. What, what's advocacy mean to you? Was your journey similar, totally different? Uh, did you start right out of the gates uh, being a little more advanced versus me? No, my my first beginnings <laughs> with uh, NAFER in AOU at that time was not really advocacy. It was more uh, going to the lunch meetings where the rest of the insurance agents and financial advisors in town were, would go to lunch and starting to build relationships with them. And then we started... Uh, AOUTC classes, which is more education, and that's what I was really uh, wanted from, from NAOU at that time, uh, was, was the education and the relationship with the, some of the other uh, agents. Uh, and it wasn't for several years until I got a phone call to, and was asked to uh, be in Austin for a committee hearing during the Texas legislature, uh, because my member, uh, my state rep was on a key committee that was there were some uh, bills that uh, believes actually the um, creditor protection bill uh, was and I was asked to go to Austin and that's where the bug got me and that's when I really became active in the pack and uh, started paying more attention to uh, advocacy and, and rather than just really what all we did. So I, I want to come back to that creditor protection uh, here in a moment. But uh, okay. Jason, anything to add regarding your journey? Well, uh, similar to what Doug had just described, as well as you uh, early on, it's about meeting people, networking, uh, 
um, all those things. Uh, I'm an independent agent and have been very early in my career. So I was really starving for that connection of networking and, and really um, following some of these leaders that we see in our industry today. And, you know, advocacy is supporting a cause. And my first experience with advocacy, like Doug mentioned, is you're called, someone takes you under their wings. And I went to a legislative day in Austin. And since then, I've been to all the legislative days as well as, uh, you know, fly-ins. And so what's cool about this call is it starts at home, but there's opportunities for anyone on the call that may not be as involved with advocacy to get involved, especially at our state conference in February. There'll be an opportunity to go to the Capitol. But um, it was through those types of activities that I got engaged in that led to a stronger advocating mindset. So let's let's stay with that uh, the legislative meeting theme. Can either of you talk a little more in detail about what a legislative meeting looks like? I mean, the, the most common thing I hear from newer members or people that are starting their own advocacy journey is, Man, I don't know anything about politics. I don't know what to do. Why do you even go? Can you guys maybe speak to that a little bit? You, you bet. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, most of the people that do attend meetings, uh, you have someone there that's more experienced and that usually has a relationship. So they tend to lead the meeting, but we also um, work with the other um, attendees that come to the meeting. Uh, many times um, it's just uh, a very informal conversation because you have to realize that these folks uh, don't always know all the details of some of these bills and, and really what the end result might be. So we're just trying to help educate them and they appreciate it. Uh, David Farabee used to say when he would do our um, legislative uh, breakfast before we went to the Capitol at the state level, he would always come and, and give us our little intro in meeting with lawmakers because David is a NAPA member and he also served in the Texas House, I believe, six terms. So one thing he said is be yourself, be comfortable, realize that these people want you to be there and take a picture. And so, you know, some of those meetings are just um, very, very comfortable especially when you have someone like Doug Massey attending with you and, and uh, Rick or, or yourself, Brandon, but. So Doug, did that surprise you when you, uh, when you first started going to these legislative meetings that, that maybe the lawmakers didn't know as much as you thought or were really delighted to see you? It, it was, it, they're very welcoming. They appreciate you being there. Uh, they're as eager to learn what we have to say, you know, especially if you're from the district uh, and you've traveled all the way to Austin or certainly if you've traveled all the way to Washington, D.C. to to meet with them. They're interested, interested in what you have to say. And they don't know the nuts and bolts and all the uh, complexities of maybe the legislation that we're there to talk about. So they want to hear what we have to say and, and they're interested in it and they appreciate it. So uh, and another thing I'll tag on to what Jason said a few minutes ago, when we go to a congressional conference in Washington, D.C. in May, we spend a, a good portion of the day before in a briefing session where we're told about the, the issues, uh, our talking points, and like, and you, you'll be with someone who's done that before. Uh, and if you're not, you'll be well prepared. You'll be confident in, when you go into those uh, meetings or and, and sometimes those are with staff. And that's something that maybe we get to later on uh, today is, and those are every bit as important as those meetings with staff sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, I was surprised first time I met with a staff person and how much they actually knew. And, and in many cases, I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but I've certainly found that sometimes the staff knows more and you're almost better off sitting down with a staffer than you are with a lawmaker. Very much so, because uh, that staff person may be, have experience in that. And when the time gets real critical, maybe before the vote or when they're trying to make the decision about where that lawmaker is going to, how they're going to vote, that staff person will remember that conversation. They'll remember the positions that, that we took. And um, so, and we may not be there the day before the, the bill goes to the floor or whatever. So that staff person is, uh, is the one that's going to have that lawmaker's ear right before the vote. So that's very, very important. Uh, I think, Jason, you've always impressed upon me that if you really peel the onion back, it's no secret that 
staffers are actually the ones that run Capitol Hill. Exactly. We know that interns run all that. Uh, the other thing, too, to just mention is that, you know, NAFE has become family through these processes, right? Um, I'm very close to a lot of the members in NAFE, and it has it's resulted or it's because of these types of venues that we go to, these types of uh, settings at the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol, uh, you name it. And it is some of the best times I've had have been around advocacy and the opportunity to be together as a group. You know, that, that's so funny you say that because I think we each started talking about our journey, how it began with fellowship, forming friendships, and trying to increase our sales and then eventually led to advocacy. And if you think about those meetings, and I'll echo that, man, I'm there for advocacy, but I'm having lunch, just like Doug said, I'm having fun with my friends. And if you don't watch out, you might learn a sales idea or two. So exactly. it's, a, it's a ton of fun, a ton of fun. So let, let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit, maybe. Let, let's talk about uh, you know, what are maybe some clear and discernible wins that you guys can remember from your time in the industry. Uh, the positive impact that, that NAFA has had on laws or practices as it relates to our business. Sure. I'll, well, I'll, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. Well, you start kick off, Doug. Probably would be a good one uh, to kick off is the credit protection that you've already brought up. Yeah, the credit protection bill is well before I was really, really active. It's a bill that kind of brought me into uh, advocacy. And that's where the, the life insurance death proceeds cash values and annuity cash values are creditor protected there they survive bankruptcy even uh, and that was an interesting bill when nafa took tafa texas took that on because the banking commission banking community was so powerful and the banking lobby was so powerful and they were opposed to it but we had lawmakers that understood the reasoning behind what we want to do. It is an uphill battle and it was a tremendous win. But uh, today, and I talk about this often with, with customers and, and clients about how this, this money is credit protected. And I've had clients that were, uh, had a suicide a few years ago that uh, it is a bankruptcy. Well, she still has all the life insurance funds and it's what is taking care of her family and, uh, put a girl through college and it was because it's creditor protected. And so it's a, it's a powerful story and it was a huge win. You so, make a good point. Cause I think a lot of times we get, uh, we get stuck on protection of the inside buildup, creditor protection and tend to forget that, that really what we do is about mom, dad, and the kids sure. and those businesses and, and the, the hard work we put into protecting them and the hard work we put in on Capitol Hill to further put safeguards in place is really what it's all about. Uh, sure. Jason, you were gonna add to that. Well, I'll just say that uh, similar to Doug, I, I keep those copies of the Texas Insurance Code and the Property Code in my conference room. Mm -hmm. And that's how you take advocacy to the next level because now you're illustrating to them, we have been part of this because I am part of this association that I serve in. And that right there really elevates your professionalism because then they go, oh, wow. That's cool, you know, and, and another one I'm thinking of is Senate Bill 567. Um, I have a picture of us, uh, Doug was included on that and I was very blessed and thankful that I could be there. But the bill signing of Senate Bill 567, which simply increased annuity protections in the life and health guarantee fund to 250,000 as well as life insurance cash values. And that came about when the 2008 financial meltdown hit. We're sitting in a boardroom in Austin, Texas on South Congress and saying, you know, we really need to look at these protections. And we thought we would have more pushback from the industry, but we really didn't. And so we found a Senate sponsor, a, a House sponsor in Texas, and we ran with it. And it was past uh, that session. So we were, uh, that's another win that we use all the time. Every policy you deliver has that guarantee language in the policy. Right. And so yes. that right there to me is, is a big time. And, win and it's, well. it's, it's kind of a, when, when that comes up in conversations, it, it's kind of powerful to also say to your, your client, say, well, I was in the room when Governor Perry signed this legislation. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's, um, it gives you something to talk about. It builds your credibility when you can, uh, when you understand it and you were there when it, when it became part of law. 
you know, you guys are going on to my next question already. Um, and that is, uh, what, is that, what do advocacy conversations look like with your clients? And, and it sounds like both of you weave that into your client interactions. Um, and I can't imagine that can do anything other than enhance your credibility as well as your client's understanding of how important these things are. Anything okay. to add on to that? Well, it, it, it is. It just it adds credibility and through social media and through conversations. And over the years that I've been active <clears throat> in advocacy, my clients and customers, they know that I am very much involved, that I go to D.C. a couple of times a year and that I'm in, in Austin during the session a couple of times. Uh, and I've testified uh, in Austin a number of times over the years, as has Jason and, and many others on this call, I'm sure. Uh, but th they know you're involved. And when you can sit down, you can talk about you know the secure act which was a big legislation we passed a few years ago in, in congress well we were lobbying for that in washington dc and we understood the, the strong points and the talking points and the advantages of some of the many many things that were in the secure act but when you talk about that you were a part of the process of getting that passed and, and then you can explain those benefits to your to your clients and your policyholders well it just it just adds a tremendous amount of credibility mm -hmm. And real life case in point, I was at a tire shop the other day, a client of ours asked me, hey, do you still go to DC and meet with lawmakers every now and then? Oh yeah, we still go once a year at least. And then we have a state, um, you know, legislative day, but the client asked me. So mm -hmm. that's when you know they realize that you're involved. Yeah. You know, something you might think about that's, uh, I, I find real powerful when, when I go, is I set my autoresponder. So mm -hmm. that when clients email me, it tells them exactly where I am, the association that I'm with, and the reason that I'm there, and why I'm able to be there is because of their the business that they provide and the relationship that we develop. Exactly. Uh, and I, I give great responses to that. Uh, well, Jason, keep uh, keep teed up there because this next question is for you. I mean, uh, advocacy within NAPA is just for life insurance, right? Oh, of course not. Uh, you know, I'm in the employee benefits business, so, you know, there's a longstanding history of uh, working with other types of um, products uh, that were a threat uh, in terms of laws. Uh, for example, I can think of Hillary Care, as, as Doug can recall, all that battle that occurred back in the 90s. Uh, and most recently, you know, the big one would be Obamacare. And so even though we're employee benefits type um, agency, uh, those things were going to affect us. And we didn't know where agents stood. We didn't know if we were still going to be in the business when this passed or not. Uh, that being said, NAFA was a real advocate in working with other associations that were pushing back on some of this to keep us in the loop. And now what we find out is we're more important than ever because this is very complicated, more so than it used to be. So those are a couple of examples that are really not related to insurance as far as life insurance right uh well we've talked a lot about the positives the wins the impacts we've had on our clients uh let's talk on the other side of the fence what, what are some uh, some victories we've had keeping bad legislation from from getting to the table well i i think one huge win for us was the dol fiduciary rule uh, that was concerning in our industry by a lot of different groups, uh, NAFA taking the real lead on that. And it, it got to the point when we saw that this was really not going anywhere and we were not doing well on, on the front there. Um, NAFA Texas um, filed a lawsuit along with other Texas associations in the northern part of our state and um, sued the Department of Labor. U.S. Chamber of Commerce and some other organizations had uh, this lawsuit going on as well, but then later on they combined those. Uh, it, it was uh, first argued in the Northern District Court uh, in, in North Texas, and we really didn't receive the favorable ruling that we thought we would. But then later as it got appealed and this thing gained more momentum, then it ended up on a judge's desk and he vacated the ruling. And that right there is a huge victory because when that rule was implemented, companies started right away pulling their securities business. And, and it simply became then a truth that by implementing that stringent rule, 
customers were going to get hurt because they didn't have the products available. So, you know, DOL is a huge victory that I don't think people give enough credit to that victory. Great. How about you, Doug? Hi. I agree completely with the DOL was a, a huge win in that we were able to get that vacated in the uh, Fifth Circuit in, in New Orleans in that court. Another win that happened a few years ago in, in Texas where, where legislation was, where we had, it killed legislation was um, there was a, a daughter of a annuity holder in San Antonio that was actually taking distributions from her mother's uh, annuity, large, just several hundred thousand dollars that she had basically stolen from her mother. Well, she convinced a member of the House and a member of the Senate to carry legislation which would require uh, for any annuity distributions in Texas, you had to have a, the policyholder had to be, the signature had to be notarized or it had to be uh, signed and witnessed by an agent of the company. Well, this was introduced and we were, of course, were opposed to that. Uh, you know, this should have been handled in the criminal code, not the insurance code. Um, and so we lobbied against that. And that was one of those uh, where we brought in and, and involved in that also with some of our uh, other associational partners like Texas Association of Life and Health Insurance Companies, you know, Tal High, uh, Independent Insurance Agents of Texas. We had a number of the companies that we built a coalition and uh, lobbied very hard in, in the Senate and the House and, and that those that bill never got out of the committee. We were able to just kill it in committee. Whatever was passed out of the committee, so we were able to, to kill that legislation. So sometimes those are also wins even though we didn't pass anything. Right. There, was, there was another one, I don't know which one you want to take this that recently got uh, uh, stricken down and that was uh, the necessity to put our license number on cards and, uh, and advertising. Yes, yes. Yeah, so you've been like a, a plumber or electrician in Texas driving around with your license number on your vehicle or your card. Uh, but the other thing I'll point out, too, you know, the PRO Act came up recently at the federal level, and that was a, a big deal because um, what that was trying to do is lump us in as employees with all these uh, insurance companies versus contractors. Well, you take an independent guy like me, I represent a lot of different companies, and many of you, you do as well. That being said, so so which employee health plan am I eligible for if they offer a health plan? Um, which company am I really the primary employee with? It was a mess. And, and I think once we, we got up to D.C. and uh, provided input telling them our story, then it pretty much died in the Senate. But uh, that's another good example of stuff that gets beaten back that doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. You know, there was a question I saw pop up in the chat about could DOL resurface again? Uh, I want you guys to speak to that, but, you know, I, I lump that along with any victories we've had or things that we've uh, been able to squash. Uh, you know, inside buildable life insurance has been protected since 1913. I've lost count since I've been in the business. How many times that has hit somebody's desk or plan or radar to strip away? So <laughs> remaining ever vigilant is, is super key in this. It's not a one and done, but regarding DOL, there's been some rumblings. Uh, Doug, Jason, Doug, I'll, I'll that? take that. Uh, in June, the DOL in their calendar <laughs> did propose that there probably will be, they will send in December of this year over to o, uh, OMB Office Management Budget, uh, the, a, a new proposed fiduciary rule. Uh, OMB will have 90 days to, to review that and be a comment period. So we're gonna be dealing with the DOL again next year. Uh, just, we feel certain that uh, they never were happy with the defeat that they were handed in, in New Orleans because of our lawsuit. Uh, and they've been in the background looking for the opportunity and the political environment is, is such that uh, I think we're gonna see that, uh, we'll be fighting that again next year, I believe. Well, and the SEC is also um, yeah. studying a proposal as well. So it's very likely they might offer something. So and that brings up an interesting point. When we talk about legislation, either in, in Texas uh, legislat legislature or Congress, but we're also, our industry is also dealing with regulators more and more, uh, which is um, a different type of advocacy when you're. Uh, basically fighting the regulators uh, rather than trying to influence 
um, legislation. It takes a little bit different skill set, a little bit different uh, tactics, but NAFA's very, very good at it. We've won way more of those battles than we've certainly lost over the years. Gotcha. Well, I've got a couple more questions before we give, uh, give the NAFA national staff some time here. Uh, can either of you tell me about a relationship that became meaningful as a result uh, of advocacy? Jason, you've got a great story. Well, um, I'll just start with one of the uh, new relationships we've established. Uh, we have uh, a new district because of realignment in the last census. And so my district is uh, U.S. House District 15. And so there's a, a Republican and Democrat running that district. I've uh, developed a relationship with um, Monica De La Cruz, who's running in District 15. And, and it's actually... Uh, polls are looking like um, she's probably going to take that district. Uh, of course, the midterms will determine that. But, you know, what's cool about that, I first met her in the community at one of the uh, fundraisers she was having. So this is how you get in on grassroots. It starts in your own town, in your own district. And since then, we've had multiple events that she's invited me to. And I told her, that uh, when you get elected, I want to be your insurance and financial uh, springboard. And she's actually called me last week and we're having a meet and greet here September 23rd. So that's a new relationship. But unless somebody gets in on the ground floor, you, you don't build that. Now, another one I'll think of, Doug, and you can you know mention this one. Look at the relationship that we've had with John Cornyn through the years. Sure. That one stands out is a real strong one. Absolutely. Um, and one that stands out to me, I was uh, on a first name basis with my Congressman, Mike Conaway. Well, he retired and uh, matter of fact, I, I saw where he's actually in town today for another function, but he retired and uh, my new Congressman is August Fluger, who I did not know, but I knew we had a common friend and uh, asked for an introduction. Well, uh, August and I hit it off. We had some things in common. He has three daughters. I had three daughters and he's a little younger than I am. So we had that common ground and uh, in no time I had his personal cell phone number. And from time to time I text him and uh, have a conversation with him. And so it's once you have a little bit of experience doing, you know, learn how to build those relationships. It's uh, it just, uh, it gets easier and easier uh, yeah. to do that. So it's, it's very rewarding to uh, uh, send a text and you get a text right back um, from your member of Congress. It's, and it takes a little bit of time, but it, it those relationships are out there and it's not something that any of us can do that. Gotcha. Well, I'll wrap up with one last question with, uh, with you, Doc, and we'll probably dovetail into, into staff here in a minute. But the question I often get is, when, when I start contributing to the PAC, how does that money get split up? between the local, the federal, and the state level? Okay, uh, our, our PAC will raise, our PAC, AFA PAC. AFA PAC is, is somewhat complicated. <laughs> Stephanie may have to help me out a little bit here, but let me, the, the money that you contribute to, to AFA PAC, 60% uh, of that stays with our federal PAC, NAFA PAC. The other 40% of, those, of your contributions come back to your state if they're eligible, come back to your state to the state pack now we have 52 state packs there's one in guam and one puerto rico so there's 52 uh, and then there, each state has a state pack committee that decides which lawmakers which candidates uh, which campaigns are going to going to support at the national level we have a candidate selection committee which i'm on and it's a broad array of folks from all over the country that uh, we make the decisions of which candidates that, that we're going to support. Primarily, it's candidates in the House on financial services, uh, ways and means over in the Senate. A lot of our legislation goes through finance and banking, uh, those committees. So we support uh, candidates in, in those committees or that we feel like will end up on those committees, much like Jason mentioned, Monica De La Cruz. There's a high probability should she get elected she'll end up on financial services so uh, we're already starting to build that relationship with them uh, but that's the reader's digest version of how the the pack uh, how the pack works excellent well let's uh let, let's shift gears and take some time to have a conversation with uh, our team up in uh 
uh, on the East Coast. Uh, gosh, guys, the national staff, we absolutely could not do it without them. And, and we're blessed to have uh, Andrew Holt, who's the grassroots manager with uh, NAFA, as well as Stephanie Sheridan, senior political director. Uh, so before we talk about uh, how we get involved in grassroots, uh, let, let's finish off that question. Uh, and I think, Stephanie, you're probably uh, well suited to answer that. And that is the one I get all the time. So advocacy is included in my membership, right? Yeah. Un unfortunately, no um, advocacy is, well, the PAC isn't included in your membership. Uh, PACs cannot... Um, well, not PACs, NAFA cannot directly support candidates for office. It's against the rules. And so NAFA has a PAC, both federal and state PACs all across the country, that supports the candidates on behalf of NAFA. Um, earlier today, when I was on the PAC committee call, we talked about how we are the insurance party and we're not for Republicans or Democrats. We really work to... Um, get that on the fence marking where we're a you know 50 50 45 55 kind of split between how we support um republicans and democrats so unfortunately your dues goes to help pay for lobbyists and things like that but they cannot pay for supporting um candidates that's what our pack does well stephanie let's uh, let's uh Stay in that, uh, that line of thought. Can you explain how the dollars get distributed? In other words, do they, how they go to lobbyists, to back the candidates, uh, and maybe some statistics surrounding that regarding our effectiveness? Sure. So the money goes directly to candidates. Um, in 2017 or 2018, the NAFA board made a decision that 100% of those mm -hmm political contributions that come in would go directly to candidates. And so that 60% that Doug was talking about that stays with NAFA PAC is all going directly to support candidates. We, um, we have a staff on the PAC side um, that works with that candidate selection group. And once we determine that we're going to support a candidate, we then mm -hmm. um, work with the state to get people to attend in-state meetings with that person and with our um, in-house lobbyists to attend stuff in DC. The maximum we can support any candidate is $10,000 um, for uh, the, gen the primary and the general election. So we generally like to split that up 50-50 as well between our in-house lobbyists attending events and you, the NAFA advocates um, attending events. That's how you can continue to build that relationship that does and Jason have been talking about all day is by attending events with these legislators back in district and keep making them see your face. Gotcha. Thank you. Andrew, let's uh let, let's put you front and center. Can you maybe cover the how? You know, how do members get involved? Uh, how do they make contributions? How do they uh turn up that grassroots effort? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, thanks for having me on today, y'all. And I'm really excited to talk with with you guys about how you can get involved and you know flip that light switch of joining the advocacy efforts. And to be completely honest with y'all, there's never been a better time to get involved. We're headed into the midterm elections. There's gonna be hundreds of events across the country and definitely in Texas in October, both at your state and federal levels. So the first thing I would do is encourage you, if you have never been to a campaign event, go. Get out there, see what it's like. It's one of those things, I know I'm very passionate about it, but these, and I, I I did a lot of work. I cut my teeth in Texas politics years ago, and you all know how to throw campaign events. I'll tell you that much. So um, definitely try that. There's a couple of other ways that you can get involved um, right now. And so the first thing I would implore people to do is go and sign up at our advocacy ambassador um, form on our website. And we can put that in the chat uh, after I finish. That, that, that form will allow us to find out you know, exactly what you're looking to do, um, what kind of time frames during your schedule work best. And then also give us your name. So that way I can, we can pass that information on to your local grassroots chair, whether it's the state or federal um, uh, chair, so that they can get you moving and, and plugged in. That's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do is um, reach out to your chapter exec. They can also get you plugged in with the correct people if you've never been in, involved on the advocacy front. Um, and then Another thing you can do is, as they mentioned earlier, um, state day on the hills are coming up. You know, y'all's legislature on the state front is going to be uh, going back into session 
uh, in January. And I know you guys have a big day planned for that. So, you know, throw your hat in the ring again. That's where that advocacy ambassador sign up form will really help us to identify who wants to be a, part, a participant, you know, because we have, you guys have a, a massive congressional and, and, and house makeup. We want to have relationships with all our legislators. We have members in every congressional district, but we want to take that to the next level and have relationships with every member in every district. And that's no easy feat. And that's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, Jason mentioned the best way to, to get involved right off the bat. It's getting involved early, um, becoming that subject matter expert for your, your legislator or candidate who's going up to DC or going to Austin. Um, you know, we want to make sure that you're advocating not just on behalf of yourself or NAFA, but you're also advocating on behalf of your clients and their best interests. Um, another way you can do and you can get involved is go visit our advocacy action center and log those relationships. You know, one of the things we have to do is we have to know exactly what relationships we're working with. Um, legisla legislation moves pretty quickly, especially at the state level. So when we see, you know, bills drop, whether they're good or bad, we want to be able to uh, mobilize quickly with not only constituent outreach, but constituents that have relationships with key members on, you know, whether what uh, whichever committee of jurisdiction is at. So those lists, logging those relationships is really helpful for us because when when those bills drop, we can immediately go and say we have four members that have relationships. So all of them reach out. You know, everyone has varying levels of relationships. So it's Again, that's a big one. So if you have not, if you have relationships and you've never heard about logging them, please go do that. That's going to be very <laughs> moving forward. Um, that goes back to the main point of with advocacy at NAFA, it's about building bench strength. We want to have multiple people in line with relationships. So at any given time, if you know, if Rick has the best relationship with his member of Congress and, and he's out of town or out of pocket, we have two or three members that are constituents as well that we can call on to say, Hey, Rick isn't here, but we've got these three folks. So we always have that bench strength. And then finally, and this is the big one, um, we offer a training course in grassroots advocacy um, when it's three courses. Uh, they take about 45 minutes to an hour to complete. And I would really implore every NAFA member to do these. It's free to NAFA members. It's quite expensive if you're not a NAFA member because it is something that we are exclusive in offering. And that uh, completing that will give you your financial securities advocate badge. And what that says is that you are a trusted advocate within NAFA. And those courses are really great because what they do is at time, right off the bat, they may seem like, it, you know, it's, oh, I know how to set up a meeting. I, I do that all the time. Well, it gets you into the different mindset of how policy works and how you can. And, and so each of those training courses will take you in the next step of, okay, here's how I set up a meeting. Now, here's how I plan to work with the meeting. Here's how I, um, you know, if, if I'm not meeting with my member, here's how I interact with staff. And really, it just provides that foundation, I think, that everyone should have when we go to, you know, whether it's going to Austin or you come up to Washington, D.C. And the key is that the third one, and I really, this is the big one, it's finding your story. What is your story that we can tie to legislation? Because we can go up and tell a legislator, vote yes or no. To be honest with you, if you have a story, if you have that personal anecdote of, hey, well, I had a client come and tell me this, and this is why I'm here advocating, mm -hmm. you know, that's impactful. That's the ones that are going to go, when they go to the floor, they go, oh, yeah, I remember when I met with Doug, he didn't just tell me to vote yes. He told me, a, I have now an anecdote that if I want to go up to the pulpit and, and, and tell people why they need to vote yes, I now have a personal constituent story I can share that can help sway other members. Those are, those are the big ones. And that, you know, again, signing up for that advocacy ambassador uh, uh, form is the number one way you can, you can start this ball, you know, get the ball rolling. Wow. That's a, that's a ton of info. Thank you. Andrew. I'm always amazed at, at the amount of resources that NAPA has for us that we know about and that we don't know about. So it's, it's good to get reminded. Uh, so I hope you're watching the chat box. Uh, you're, uh, you're, <clears throat> Your representatives here are putting information in there that's vital to your advocacy journey. And I'm sure we'll follow up with a list of those resources as well. Brandon, I'm glad that he brought up the story mm -hmm. because that's what we do is we're telling our story and we represent clients, which are constituents in our lawmakers district. And, and that right there has a huge impact. And the other thing I'll say this, uh, former CEO, late Des Taylor, always told us, that money is the mother's milk of politics. So like it or not, that's just the reality of the world we live in. 
Mm -hmm. And um, it's just uh, telling your story is, is what we do. Sure. Uh, hey, I've got a question for Stephanie before I do. Rick, are we seeing any activity in the chat box? And if not, guys, uh, you've got the people here that can answer your questions. So here in about uh, six, uh, seven, eight minutes, we're going to open that up to Q&A. So if you can load that up, we can get cranking right from the get-go. Uh, Stephanie, the next question is for you. Jason earlier had mentioned working with other associations. Can, can you talk through a little bit other associations that NAFA National works with <coughs> to uh, uh, promote positive legislation? And, and yes. maybe some, some wins and victories as well that we uh, were able to achieve only because of that cross-collaboration. Sure. So um, NAFA partners with a variety of different um, insurance associations and um, other um, companies like New York Life or Northwestern Mutual. I believe, and Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong here, it's about uh, 24 partners that we currently um, actively work with. And whether um, it's here up at national or sometimes in the states we're working together to defeat legislation all of those stories that you heard jason and doug talk about um while we have you guys the citizen advocates out there um nafa professional staff behind the scenes are working with all of those 24 partners to help also defeat legislation and be up in the member space and their staff on a regular basis. So um, we very much so enjoy working with our coalitions. They're very important. Sometimes they bring um, issues to us and ask us for our expertise where we can be the leaders. And sometimes they're the leaders, but that's what's great in a coalition is that everybody's working together for one common goal. Andrew, do you wanna chime in there with anything? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. We have um, we work with partners as well as coalition partners, um, both at the state and federal. And just just for an example of two wins that I that come off to the top of my in my mind, um, in Kentucky, the Kentucky State Legislature uh, decided that they wanted to potentially pass a bill that would put a six percent sales tax on financial services, uh, financial service advising. So on top of all your typical taxes, just for uh, financial services, you'd have another six percent tacked on which is a huge number when we're talking about, you know, the economy and we want to, we want people to, you know, move their money smartly. So we worked with some uh, coalition partners to find folks to testify. And we ended up squashing that bill in committee before it went to the Senate floor, which is a huge win. And then another one, um, a worker classification bill, going back to what Jason mentioned at the PRO Act at the state level, you know, these y'all, we're a copycat legislature. If it happens in one state, it, the likelihood of it popping up in another is high. So in Delaware, they wanted to do a worker classification change, which, as we mentioned earlier, it's a huge impact on our industry. And again, we worked with, uh, I believe, ACLI and some other coalition partners to, to kill that bill in committee before we even had to worry about it taking a vote. So th those are just two of the wins of how we work together with our partners and, and mobilizing both our advocates as well as our, you know, um, our, our clients. Awesome. Uh, another question for uh, for Stephanie here, and that is, uh, I, I hear this from time to time, and that is, hey, my company has their own PAC. Can I contribute to NAFA, and, and why should I? What's the difference? Yes, and so um, many of our um, captive agents companies have PACs, and we would highly recommend that you contribute to both PACs. Um, there's the, the big differences are a company is going to focus on corporate issues, while NAPA is going to focus on issues that impact your business and your clients. And the biggest difference is your company PAC is generally going to only be a federal PAC, whereas, as we've been talking about, um, insurance is regulated heavily at the state level. And so your PAC I'm sorry, I have my hair in my eyes. Your um, federal PAC, and we have those state PACs all across the country so that we can defeat all the copycat bills easily across the country. It's um, it's just a little nuance that your company PAC might not have. So we, we encourage you to do both and really support any cause that you're, you're involved in. Thank you for that, Stephanie. And for the reminder that I don't have to worry about hair in my eyes. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, you know, guys, uh, I want to shift over to some questions here that are popping up in the uh, the chat. But I, I was told early on that uh, that NAFA is the best career insurance 
you can get. And, and I firmly believe that. And my, my supposition is that all our panelists do as well. Uh, before we get to the chat, Doug, I want to clarify one thing, that flow of funds you described from our PAC contributions, is that automatic or is that something our members have to elect? Uh, some members cannot <laughs> they have to opt in uh, to have to share with the state. There are some companies, some broker dealers and some restrictions uh, for pay to play rules where uh, one of our members may not be able to uh, contribute to the state pack, but they can contribute to. So it, it's an option and um, that you can check the box whether to contribute or, or allow the sharing of funds back with the state pack or keep them all with uh, with the federal pack, which is overwhelming majority. I hadn't seen the numbers in good in some time, but the overwhelming majority of the funds that go in are shared back with the states mm -hmm. at, at 40%. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, we've got about 10, 12 minutes before Rick gives us the uh, the hook here. So let's uh, just open forum. We'll address some of these uh, these comments and questions that have come in. The first one is, can I contribute if I'm not a member? You cannot contribute to IFAPAC if you are not a member. It is a benefit of being a member of NEPA that you get to uh, purchase your career insurance protection by contributing to IFAPAC. Kind of like you can't add a rider if you don't have the base insurance. Exactly. Got it. Uh, another question is, can I can I just get started by contributing and not necessarily go to the legislative meetings? So Andrew, cover your ears, but absolutely yes, you can do that. Um, it is it is um, if you you know don't want to report a relationship, you can certainly we will happily take your money and your thoughts on where you'd like your money to uh, go. But um, you do not have to do all of the other fun stuff. But we will encourage you if you're a contributor, we'll keep asking you and giving you that opportunity to tell us yes someday. Yeah. No, so you Jason. know what, Go ahead, Jason. Uh, Brandon, I would say yes, perfectly fine, but you don't really become passionate about it until you mm -hmm. get involved. Mm -hmm. And that is when you become passionate and all of a sudden the money that we're giving to the pack, it, it's an afterthought. It just happens automatically on a bank draft. <clears throat> and so the more you're involved, whether it's church, this association, anything that you're involved with, you only get passionate about it when you get involved. And so start with the pack. That's a great start. But then start looking at other opportunities for someone like myself and Doug, Brandon, you know, Rick, to take you under our wing and help you uh, get introduced to this. You know, there, there's so many parallels in our business. I was told early on that you may or not remember the day you get in the business, but the day you have your first claim, the business gets in you. And, and the pack is very similar. And, and you know, I know there's a, uh, I believe there's a minimum. Um, another question is how much does NAFA recommend that we contribute uh, as much as you can early and often, right? It's like banking. Yes. But, but you know, that, that said, let's talk about uh, something else, St. Jude's. The, uh, the $25 a month contributors, that's a certain level of contribution. Mm -hmm. And I forget what they call that. 20, 25 bucks does not sound like a lot of money. But that money that the people that only contribute that amount is what funds the expenses of St. Jude's. Mm -hmm. The research and all that comes from the big donors, but they can't keep the lights on, perform the basic function of the hospital that saves so many lives without people contributing something that seems like very minimal. So 10, 20 bucks a month doesn't seem like a lot. Yes, we need a lot of money. We need more, we'll take more. But starting small is absolutely fine. You can always ramp up from there. And if you can't, that's okay as well. My guess is like Jason said, you'll get to a point where you don't even realize it. And next thing you know, you'll be looking at that wall going, wow, I've made that make a difference. Not sure. uh, so there was a question about the renewal dates changing. That was pretty recent. Doug, Jason, you guys want to take that and how NAFA may or may not have been involved in that with our regarding licensing? Jason, I think you more familiar with that. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that because that occurred. Uh, actually, I believe it was in the um, 2015 session, possibly. But what it was, was an initiative that NAFA Texas took on. We were the lead in this initiative. Um, we looked at the fact that our CE requirements were set at 30 hours in comparative industries. We're only having some 18 
for example, Board of Realtors, 18 hours is all they require. Um, you know, banking, they're a little bit different. But the point was that we felt like that, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of CE here. Can we reduce that? And in doing so, the confusion of renewals, and that was actually an initiative that TDI had mentioned to us in a meeting that we had with them. And after that meeting, we decided, well, we'll take the ball and run with it. And so it was a combination of uh, reducing the CE hours from 30 to 24, uh, getting the renewals consistent with your birth month. And, and then the third was actually reducing fines for CE violations because our fines were way higher than other industry peers. And so that, that occurred under our watch and it, it was a good thing. Excellent. You know, this is an interesting question. Normally, the uh, when we talk specific, specifically about life insurance, it's always about inside buildup. But there was a question about taxing the death benefit. And I don't know if national or state wants to take that. But the question is, has that ever been presented? And if so, has there been anything recent? Well, it comes up from time to time. I mean, it's been since, what, 1913 that life insurance has uh, had the tax uh, treatment that it does. And we've, it comes up from time to time, we've defeated it, we've peeled it back every time. But if you look at our industry as a whole, there's so many tax breaks that we have. Virtually every product from disability income to group life insurance to almost every product has some tax advantage or some benefit. And that's what we have to protect. I, I don't believe Congress has any intent to uh, tax life insurance proceeds, the death benefit of life insurance. I don't think they really want to do that. I don't think that'd be popular. I don't think it would pass. But there's so many other ways that they can tinker with the tax code, uh, take away the stretch IRA, uh, the pay fors. So we're having to defend a lot more than just the benefits of life insurance and the tax advantages of life insurance. It's all of our products has these, you know, disability income, like I said we've got to defend all of those things. And when Congress looks out here, they say, well, we want to, we need to pay for it. We want to do this, but we got to pay for it. Well, they're going to look at our industry and quite honestly, there's a lot of dollars that our industry handles and goes through our, our, our insurance policies that is, is not taxed. It's got those tax advantages. So we're a, we're low hanging fruit. So, well, if we can take away this little, uh, pay for, we can, we can have our new program over here. We can do it by, and so that's what we're having to defend. It's, it's not, it's, a, there's a number of things we're having to defend. Uh, several sessions of Congress ago, they, uh, we identified over 1300 bills that had some interest to NAPA and it ranged from life insurance to annuities, to disability income, to uh, all of our products. It was, now some of them were innocuous. Some of them were any big deal. Some of them we weren't opposed to. Some of them we may have been in favor of. Uh, but we got to watch for that one that you know can uh, really harm us, and that's what our, our staff in DC does, and what us as the ground troops and the grassroots, uh, when we get called into action to defend, when we feel like we're going to lose one of those key benefits uh, to uh, or lose the tax advantages of that. So that's what we're having to defend. There's a number of things. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's almost akin to, to pork barrel spending. I remember, gosh five, 10 years ago, there was a report that came out, maybe staff will remember this, but it identified some upteen millions or billions mm -hmm. that were available and ripe for taxation if they just made some tweaks. So it actually became almost a cafeteria style list instead of, well, maybe we get tax life insurance. Oh, they'll fight. It was A to Z soup to nuts laundry list of things we were on guard for that we had never thought of. Yeah. And so, so that's what we're that's what we're uh, up against. Gotcha. Another question here: How do uh, how do people find out when the legislative meetings are? Well, in terms of uh, your district meetings, or well, I'm, I'm I'm sticking to the question I got here, Jason. It wasn't got that you. Restrictive. Okay. Well, let's just I'll... let's just talk about district meetings. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> first of all. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet with your lawmaker, then I would just encourage you to start that process, okay? And then get on their mail list because getting on their email list is going to keep you informed of what is going on in their district, a fundraiser, uh, any of those in-district meetings. So I would first get on the mail list because that right there will keep you informed of your district meetings. Naturally, when we're 
uh, on the Hill, we have, um, you know, scheduled meetings that we coordinate. But so the mail list is probably the best way to keep informed of the end. I think uh, just guessing at what the answer is going to be and how long it'll take. This will probably be our last question. So I want to shift back to staff uh, probably for a wrap up here. And that is, uh, is there a current list of issues or bills that NAEP is looking to support or defend against? And if so, can you highlight those? So you can go to the main NAFA website and under the advocacy tab, you will see um, federal and state and you will be able to from there navigate to your state's specific issues. There'll be a map under state where you can hover over Texas and see any bills that we know that Texas is following. You might be following more bills than that, but those are the bills. And then under federal, you can see the list of all the bills. Also, if you go to the Advocacy Action Center, which is at nafa.org forward slash advocate, when you click into grassroots, there's a place where it says federal bills. And if you click on there, you can also see another list of just the federal bills that we're tracking. And just to piggyback on that, you can also in the Advocacy Center, you can go to Take Action and you will be able to see the bills that we are currently working on, whether to block or to, uh, to promote. So you can take action very easily by clicking the button. It'll send a form email to your legislator. Uh, both we, we run those for both state and federal uh, action alerts. So that's a great place to see what exactly we're working on at that uh, day to day basis. Andrew, you know what's really cool about that is you don't have to stick to the form letter. It gives you that mm -hmm. as a uh, as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And if you're out of time, you just want to fill up their inbox, that's fine. But you can also personalize it, add some to the front, yeah. change it all together. Uh, it, it really does make it easy. The tools are, are really powerful. All right, Rick, I, I've got us at uh, three minutes till, so I'll, I'll pass back to you so you can wrap up and get us onto our day and finish up early or maybe a minute uh, beforehand. Perfect. Brandon, I appreciate the friendship, appreciate the service that you've uh, continued to display. And also uh, with Jason, Doug, Stephanie, and, and Andrew, and, and also our, our Texas uh, executive staff as well. So, uh, you know, a big takeaway that I took from listening to, to these, especially these three gentlemen, you've got a Houston Hall of Famer, you've got a past Texas president, and you've got uh, also maybe potentially a, 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 NAF, a, a NAFA national potential candidate as well. So th these are some heavy hitters. These guys have been around. They, they understand it. They believe it. What I took away is that it, the conversation is going to happen with or without you. So I, I feel like for your client's best interest, as well as our own, is also to, to have a seat at that table and to have a voice that's heard. NAFA does a great job of it, of not only advocating on the national scale, but, but certainly here locally as well. And I know we've got folks on this call that are from around the, the National Federation. So get involved with your state, be involved with your local. You don't have to know anything about, about politics. Sometimes we're just insurance folks like myself. So I hope there's a lot of value here. I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, ear. Uh, share this message, get involved, be engaged. Uh, the the PAC has done really well, even with diminishing numbers. But now that we've seen numbers in our membership increase, I expect uh, these political action committees to grow as well. So with that said, I appreciate y'all. God bless. Be safe. Thank you. Thanks Thank for the sushi, you. Rick.